All right, we are starting. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because literally we have people from around the world tuning in. This is a massively exciting day for us at CBC Sports because we are launching our first ever CBC Sports U. Um, and so for, for wherever you're watching from, hello to all of you students, industry leaders, athletes, all of us. We're in the same virtual bubble and it feels good because like I said, we've been starving for connection. We've been starving and needing community. And so we are together in this community here today and just so thrilled um, for this first ever CBC Sports U. I see the chat lighting up, feel that chat. We'll get to, to that in a second. Uh, my name is Devin Haru. I'm a reporter and host at CBC Sports. So there are four sessions today. We're kicking this party off right now with this first uh, session, all on separate Zooms. Uh, you're watching this as an attendee, which means we cannot hear or see you. But like I said, we do want you to fill up that chat. We see you uh, letting us know where you're watching from. And like I said, uh, hundreds of people from around the world, uh, I'll let our panelists knows, uh, know that uh, we have people in Ireland, Brazil, Cuba, India, all across uh, everywhere. So this really does have global reach. I know we're going to be bold and brave and fearless today. We were talking about that, but it is Canadian made. Um, so this today is about getting your questions answered. So uh, after a brief chat with our guests, we're going to open the floor to you. We'll be taking questions through the Zoom chat function, which everybody seems uh, to have found as I see it lighting up on the side and over audio. So if you want to do that, I'll be letting you know how to do that. But basically, you got to raise your hand, do the things. I know you guys have done all of that. More on that later. And closed captioning is also possible for accessibility. So you can turn that on right at the bottom of your screen. Let's get into it. If you can see it, you can be it. Why representation in sports matters. I'm thrilled to be hosting this honored really to be hosting this. Uh, a little bit about me real quickly. I'm a proud Saskatchewanian, born and raised in Saskatoon. 15 years ago, which I can't really wrap my head around, uh, I was a sports editor at the University of Saskatchewan newspaper, and I came out to the world publicly. So yes, there are gay sports reporters. <laughs> um, and I came out to the world um, in a coming out article. I had a weekly column called Let's Be Honest. And my lead line was, let's be honest, I'm your sports editor and I am gay. And I was a hockey player. I quit hockey because of my being gay because I couldn't stand the toxic masculinity in the locker room. Uh, it's a sport I love, but it was a sport that I felt didn't have room for me. And I sort of shrunk and, and quit some of my passion. So um, it's, been, it's been a long journey being able to get to this point and speak openly and vulnerably and, and open-heartedly about my journey, but um, but I'm really happy to be here and honored to be here. And uh, and I know our panelists have an incredible incredible journeys as well. So I'm really excited to be sharing space with our panelists today. Enough about me. Let's get to our panelists. All of these women are powerful forces in their own right, pushing literally pushing and moving forward the conversation on diversity and representation beyond the headlines and beyond performative BS. So let's start with a woman who has been at the forefront of the work being done around racism and misogyny in sport, never shying away from the tough questions and often leading the conversation. Shireen Ahmed is a writer, public speaker, an award-winning sports activist focusing on, focusing on Muslim women in sports in the intersections of racism and misogyny. She is a co-creator of Burn It All Down podcast and she brings the heat, she brings a fire, um, which is the feminist sports podcast that analyzes sport culture from an intersectional feminist lens. Shireen, we've shared airspace before. The last time we did that when the Raptors won the NBA championship and we went on the parade party. Good morning to you, great to see you. Uh, welcome, so grateful you're here. Thank you for having me. Hey, everybody. My crew, my fave peeps are up in here. Hello. Awesome. And as you can see, Shireen and I spoke uh, last night about the mustard and, and navy uh, fashion. 
And, and we're going to get to Brene as well, who got the memo as well. Hey, next up, Kayla Alexander. Now, Kayla has been a Canadian pro basketball player for eight years now, currently with the WNBA's Minnesota Lynx and a member of the Canadian national team, which I am pumped about for Tokyo. Uh, Kayla, I don't think I even shared this with you, but I used to travel with head coach Lisa Tomitis on a bus all through Saskatchewan. So I am pumped for you guys. Really excited to see you do your thing in Tokyo. Um, you're also an author and an illustrator. The book, The Magic of Basketball, and I, I know you put a great YouTube video up of illustrating and how you did it. Really awesome stuff. Um, currently, Kayla is in Belgium. She's got a game in four hours, if you can believe it. But Kayla is in Belgium playing the sport she loves. I guess we got to say good afternoon to you, Kayla. Great you're here. Thanks for having me. Good afternoon to you guys as well. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with this amazing panel. Awesome. Awesome. Looking forward to hearing a lot more from you. Now I'm happy to introduce Renee Hess. Now she is a force when it comes to inclusion around the sport of hockey. And we all know there's a lot of work to be done in hockey. And Renee has taken that on and stares it down every day. She's living it. Renee is a founder of Black of the Black Girl Hockey Club, a community space for Black women in hockey and folks who love them. Their campaign, hashtag get uncomfortable, and I hope we get a little uncomfortable here today, Renee, is a pledge to disrupt racism on and off the ice and make hockey a more welcoming and accessible place for everyone, NHL teams and their fans. They're taking notice, they've been put on notice, uh, and Renee, I know you must be very happy today because your favorite team, the Pittsburgh Penguins, beat the Philadelphia Flyers last night, 5-2, and that's always a good day. You know, I'm sporting my black and yellow, as are you. Thank you so much, Shireen and Devin, for coming through on that end. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> Awesome to see you. Awesome to see you. Although I am a little worried about Sid, but we'll maybe we'll take that offline. Day to day. <laughs> day to day. Out of an abundance of caution. I'm sick of hearing that. How ridiculous. All right. Fatria Muhammad. Now listen to this. When Fatria isn't busy working on her masters, because you know, she's getting it done, she is busy building the movement for the Muslim Women's Summer Basketball League. She discovered and fell in love with basketball after moving from Ethiopia at the age of 10 to here in Canada, has been inspired by organizations like Hijabi Ballers to start her own league. You may have seen Fitria featured in recent Nike campaigns, which is just the beginning in Fitria's mission to take, uh, make the game, pardon me, uh, more inclusive, keep the conversation going around Muslim women in sport. Uh, Fatria, you certainly showcase the power of sport. Uh, you're doing incredible things. I can't wait to hear more from you. So good morning to you, Fatria. Good morning. Thank you so much for that intro. And I am excited for this conversation. So thank you. <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, as you can see, we are in for a treat today. So those are our panelists. Uh, let's dive right in. So many questions have already come in. We're obviously gonna get to, to more of them. Uh, as I see, we have people from South Carolina, Montreal, London, Thunder, Thunder Bay. I mean, we're going everywhere. But uh, Shireen, this first question has been uh, submitted to you specifically. Amina Mohammed from McGill University. I thought this was a great question. Um, if you could turn back time, that's all I'm going to sing today. If you, <laughs> if you could turn back time and talk to your 18 year old self, what would you tell her? Thanks so much. Hey, Samalek Mamina, I see you. Um, I would tell myself to do exactly everything that everyone tells you not to, which is sort of exactly what I did. Um, and it's fine to be told, no, it's fine to be told this might not work. I was advised to write about politics and to write about feminism and no one's going to care about Muslim women in sports. Believe me, people care. And you may, and, and the other thing I would say is stick to your community. This is one thing I've been thinking a lot about, particularly in the pandemic when people are isolated and people can feel not only disenfranchised, but isolated from physical community, but 
find your community because it's there. I mean, I had the pleasure of meeting all these three wonderful people in different places and I consider them part of my community and that's what it does. It brings you in, it helps you stay afloat, keeps you motivated. I'm here because I love the work. I love sports, but I also really love the community. So like 18 year old Shireen. Um, and also I would say to her, you are hundred percent right about the Birkenstocks and socks. Keep doing that. <laughs> that fashion choice. I might not be matching you on Shireen. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question, Amina and Shireen. Thank you for the answer. Um, Patria, this uh, question was submitted specifically for you. Um, as a student who is creating a movement in Canada as a passion project, how are you balancing it all right now? So there's no real separation between anything in our lives these days as we're working. Um, and, and I want to add on a little bit to this question for Tria. Um, I know that your mom was, was wondering about your choice to go into sport management at Brock University. Um, but you said, I'm doing this because I believe in this. And she was pretty proud of you when you decided to do that. So tell us a little bit about your journey and how you balance all of this and navigate all of this. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, balancing, I don't know how I'm doing it, but it's happening. <laughs> Literally, there's no secret. Uh, but what has helped me is getting up very early. I get up as early as five. Um, so getting up super early has helped me balance everything out. There's just so many things going on at once and it's hard to manage from home. Um, I feel like we're all on the same boat. Uh, so yeah, like, I don't know, try to get up early and see how you could, you know, balance it out for yourself as well. In terms of my mom not being supportive at the beginning of my journey, um, I don't know. I just knew it was the right direction for me. Like Shireen said, like she just knew it was the right decision. She just went for what she had to do. So I truly relate in that way as well. Um, I wasn't supported. Like no, literally no one from my community believed in me. Um, um, I had doubts in terms of like, what are you going to do? What is sport going to do for you? You know, so um, it's definitely a non like traditional path so as an immigrant parent she brings me here and she wants you know to I guess she wants me to create a better life for myself and eventually support her but if she hasn't seen anyone else that looks like me actually succeeding in this field how is she going to visualize me succeeding in that field right so going back to the conversation of representation like um, even you know your parents they have to be able to see someone that's that looks like you that has succeeded for them to actually believe in you so I don't believe her I don't believe in like why she didn't you know truly believe in at the beginning but I just want to be that example for you know the next generation of parents hey like look at me as an example and look at you know these individuals and the panels with me like that you know just they had to do what they got they did and we made it here grateful so yeah I hope that answered your question <laughs> Great answer. Um, it, just a quick follow up and, and maybe at, at different points throughout the, the discussion, I can get you all to weigh in because everything I, I researched and listened and I watched your, your past panels you've all spoken on and what you've been involved on. You talk so much about creating community and Shireen, I know you touched on this a little bit right off the top, but how are we creating community in a pandemic? I mean, Fatria, you start this league and then the world shuts down. How have you been able to persevere? Uh, it's already hard enough doing what you're doing, carrying that load. And then on top of it, the pandemic, do you have advice for people and uh, and persevering, keeping yourself mentally, physically healthy in the midst of all of this and yet keeping the momentum? Yeah. I love that question, Sute. Thank you. Um, so yes, before we launched the league on February of 2020, and in March, literally, um, you know, the following month, we were in lockdown. Uh, but what I want to put out there is the league wasn't something that I just came up with overnight. Um, it was something that I wanted to create literally when I got into a sport management program because that's how much I love basketball and I wanted to do something for my community. And uh, but I guess the special thing about basketball is I didn't realize it's going to be directed to Muslim women. So I think that's what makes this whole thing more special. And um, in terms of how did I, like, I knew, okay, we're in lockdown now, what are we gonna do in terms of tournament? We won't be able to do, you know, what we initially thought of. So we decided to create our online presence and create our, I guess, our brand. Um, so we decided to start up a Muslim series and um, Muslim, so it's an acronym for Muslim Women's Summer Basketball League. Luckily sounds great. So I'm excited to get everyone on that movement. Uh, but so we decided to share the, the series that highlighted uh, Muslim hoopers around the globe that are actually 
you know, also basketball players, but weren't highlighted or recognized in those communities because the advocacy and the work that Hijabi Ballas and Shireen has started are not in those countries yet. So we wanted to use that platform and also reach a global platform and advocate for Muslim women in sport by, by highlighting uh, basketball players that are, you know, owning their space and taking a space. So yeah, that's what we did. And that's how, you know, the, um, the global, I guess, voices, global platforms that we received, such as Nike, their Torrent Star and CBC Radio. Um, I feel like that's a way to just say like, we, we did what we could and we actually received um, you know what we wanted to do uh, on a global platform. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. Thanks, Vitria. All right, Renee, let's talk some hockey. Um, this has been quite a year for Black for the Black Girl Hockey Club. Um, you've got the support of NHL teams. You're working with the w, uh, uh, NWHL, pardon me, part of the Isabel Cup. What's been the secret to breaking through? Because um, I've been I've been in the hockey world. I know, I know the long lasting residue of all of the institutions that exist there. What's been, what's been the key to your success, Renee? Uh, well, that's a good question because I think I'm still asking it to myself on a regular basis. Uh, but the thing that I can come up with is first of all, I'm just trying to remain authentic to myself at all times. So every word that comes out of my mouth is my heart and that way I don't have to keep remembering what I said I just kind of you know it just comes from from me uh and second of all I think you know going back to what the other ladies said is you know we've built a community here and because of this community and our ability to connect with one another whether you know during a pandemic whether we're doing it um in a digital fashion or previously when we could get together in person, um, collectively our voices are stronger. So, you know, we're, we're getting more and more difficult to ignore the larger our community gets. And th those two things together, you know, us remaining true to our mission and, and just gathering community and focusing on, um, what is important to Black Girl Hockey Club, which is amplifying and strengthening the voices of Black women in the sport of ice hockey. Uh, it makes it uh, so that the rest of the world, whether they want to or not, they really can't ignore us. So. I, I want to follow up on that, Renee, about speaking from the heart, because it's not always easy to do that. You have a lot of conviction. Um, in in how you how you shoot from the heart and share from the heart um what what is the emotional toll how exhausting is that um day in and day out speaking from the heart because i'm i'm sure it takes a toll how do you keep yourself rooted and always being authentic you know we i spoke about this a little bit with the your producer before we we started the panel um we had a chat last and I was getting ready to take a weekend away, uh, turn off social media, uh, not check my emails, uh, not respond to the WhatsApp. And so I would definitely say that practicing self-care has been crucial in the last year to me keeping my sanity, um, you know, because anti-racism work is not just a step in and step out. This is a lifelong journey and it really changes the way that you look at the world. It changes the way that your friend groups and your peer groups are made up. And so for me, I have really got to take care of my own mental uh, spiritual and physical well-being and I do that by you know I go to talk therapy on a regular basis to take care of my mental health I you know get outside and hang out in the sunshine with my dogs and just you know take care of myself in little increments every single day in order to be able to kind of shore up that strength and come back and and deal with the the sense of the world. I've taken notes <laughs> and I feel like I might head out for a walk in the sunshine today. Um, Kayla, let's let's get to you because you have, I mean, you've got this game coming up today. Obviously, this is a game that changed your life and now you want to share that gift 
with, with so many other people. You've done this book, an author, an illustrator, The Magic of Basketball. And we have a question from Matthew Hudgens about uh, what made you want to play basketball. But uh, it, it, maybe if you could tie in a little bit about this book, because I know so many young girls are, are, are reading it now. And I know when you talked about your book, you also shared that you you wanted to see yourself reflected in children's book. I think there's a British study that shows that only 23% uh, percent of children's book have BIPOC representation in them, which is just um, disgusting, quite frankly. And so, you know, you stepped up you you took that on so maybe just share a little bit of that journey um well that's a great question so shout out to matthew for that um so briefly my uh journey with basketball started in the seventh grade i was tall for my age i was five eight uh, age 12 and a friend who was also tall at the time was, was like kayla come to this basketball trial with me so i was living in barry at the time and i went to this trial with her for barry royals and i could not play basketball to save my life. She loves to tell the story of how I went to do a layup and I hit that ball so hard off the backboard, like it was just a hot mess. Anyways, there's three rounds of tryouts. The coaches kept, um, I kept making every round. And then finally the last round, I made the team and I told my mom, she was in shock. She asked the coaches, are you sure? Like why is she on the team? And they essentially said, we can't teach Kayla height and she has that, but we can teach her how to play basketball. So just by a friend coming and encouraging me and then coaches giving me a chance, um, that started my um, journey with basketball and I realized I actually really enjoyed it and that once I like put in the work I could I actually improved and I, I discovered the self-love for it that I had and then with respect to the book which I have right here um, I thought it was really important to write this book because like you said representation like when I was growing up me and my siblings we didn't have very many books of young kids who look like me kids of color um, especially young girls who were playing sports and I thought it was very important to illustrate that and show to other young girls and young boys coming up that yes, not only can you be in books and have someone who looks like you in books, but you can also play these sports as well. And just to add a little bit to this as well, um, I truly believe in the power of sports. And there's so many positives that come from sports, from the confidence building, uh, communication, owning your voice, um, learning to advocate for yourself, the list goes on. And too many young girls are dropping out of sports and I want to change that, which is why I thought it was important to have this book that illustrates the power of sports, the great things that come with it, and hopefully encourage young girls to stay in sports so that they can get all the benefits. Um, whether you decide that you just want to use sports for the life skills, to have fun, to uh, get a free education, or even play pro, like no matter what level you choose to stay in sports, there's so many blessings that come with it. And I really want to young girls especially, to see that, and especially young girls of color who look like me to know like, this is possible. There's a book, there's a little character that looks like me and anything is possible if I believe in myself and put in the work. Awesome. Kayla, can I ask one more question? I, I think it might be a little personal on your journey, but can you share a little bit about how this past year in a pandemic and this vicious turmoil that played out this summer affected how you see your platform in the sports world? Oh, okay. Um, Sorry for putting you on the spot, but I think no, it, you think no, it's important. It's, it's real. Um, I'll be honest. At one point, I felt like I was going into like a hole because um, we're constantly, you see athletes constantly advocating for equality. Um, even this summer with the WNBA, we went hard. We decided that if we were going to play in this pandemic um, where we didn't know the full um, uh, the full effects of this virus and how it could affect us long term. If we were going to risk ourselves going to this bubble and playing basketball, a sport that we still love, um, but that's how we make our, our living, that we want to do certain things. And we decided that we were going to use our platform to advocate, educate, and bring awareness. And it was all about um, say her name, getting justice and advocating for Breonna Taylor, um, voting rights in the US, um, just bringing awareness. And it, sometimes you get to a point where you're like, is it worth it? Like, is it even making a difference? Because we're doing all this work. And then during our time in the bubble, as I'm sure you guys are all aware, um, Jacob Blake was shot seven times by the police. And then you, you, you just sit there and you're like, we're doing all this work and does it even matter? Is it even making a difference? But then on the flip side, you see like, People are having all these conversations now. Even um, friends were DMing me or like sending me messages like, hey, Kayla, um, um, I'm having these new conversations. They're uncomfortable. I didn't realize um, the effect of my words or that this was even an issue to like, there's layers to it. Um, but people are being honest and having these 
very uncomfortable, but very necessary conversations. And although you don't always see those immediate wins, you can start to slowly see the progress and the change that's happening, um, which I think is important. And I think it's great why everybody on this platform are doing incredible things, using their voice, their platform to advocate for change and to keep the conversation going because unfortunately change doesn't happen overnight, but if we continue steadily, we'll get to where we wanna be. Beautiful. And let's be very clear about the fact that it was a WNBA who did the heavy lifting and who pushed it and did not get the, um, the, the credit, which is to no surprise on anyone on the, to anyone on this panel, but uh, compelling scenes, incredible leadership. And, uh, and thank you, Kayla, truly. Uh, Shireen, I want to ask you this because uh, in our conversation last night, uh, in passing, which sort of caught my attention. You said, I don't even want to hear the word ally because I don't know what it even means anymore. But we did receive a lot of questions from people who said around diversity and inclusion, how can I be a better ally? Um, what does being an ally, and I know you didn't want me to ask you this, but I, I really do want your, your perspective on this because a lot of people right now are going, how, where do I go? What do I do? It's an interrogation of self. And um, I, I would love your, your response on this one. Yeah, note to self, not to tell you the night before what I don't want you to ask me, but like, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, whatever. It's all good. So I'm going to be very candid when I say this, your language. So these words like diversity and inclusion. Okay, I'm going to break it down for y'all say combat anti-blackness. I don't need you to lift me up and be kind. Everyone's like talking about kindness. I need y'all to be anti-racist. I need you to be anti-oppressive. I don't have time for people to talk about nice cities. We are far, far beyond that. And, you know, I'm a non-black person of color. Communities like myself need to lift up and do a lot of the heavy lifting, carry the mantle, keep going. I just, this, these whole things of let's be inclusive. No, I want you to be, I want you to be fighting anti-indigeneity. I want you to be fighting anti-blackness. I want you to be fighting homophobia. And particularly right now, there's a crisis against, there's a campaign against trans youth in the United States. And I need to say this because it's literally criminalizing children. And I'm not, I'm not here for supporting one community and ignoring another. That's not how, that's not how collaboration works. It's definitely not how community works. I feel very strongly about language. I'm a scribe at heart. I'm a journalist and words are extremely important. I, there's people out there who I understand are tentative. And when you're talking about allyship, I've heard so much in the last year or the last eight months rather, because nobody was calling me between March and June, but June, my phone wouldn't stop ringing. And the thing is the difference there is that people are afraid to do things for the reason of getting called out. This whole idea of cancel culture. Again, I don't have time for this. You either are in or you're not. You are on the bench watching the play. And I am also a contributor to TSN and I wrote a column at the end of the year. And literally I said, are you on the bench or are you in the play? You have an option here. You can't be both. So you get in there, don't mince your words, be extremely intentional. And just particularly what Kayla said, I mean, I just want to snap the whole time. But the point is, is that this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. If you're looking to eradicate racism overnight, I'm sorry, take a breath calm down. This is a long road. And there's a lot of people that have been trying to dismantle these systems of oppression for years. We're tired. It didn't come out with cap. It, it came out way before it's been here since like forever, essentially people have been resisting. So this is a long process. And like, you know, everyone is saying we will get their community integrity and persistence, but we will get there. So watch your language. And another thing that's really important to me is you don't speak over communities you don't belong to. Don't talk for communities. I'm a racialized woman, I'm not a black woman. I'm not gonna speak for the community I'm not part of. I'm not a disabled woman. I'm not gonna speak for that community. Know where your place is and, and like show solidarity actively. That's, that's what you do. And it can be things like listening, first of all, listening, sharing, resources and information knowledge sharing is very important part of community if you know of something that you know someone's like where do i donate money i often retweet um like what was happening in in texas most recently with the, the storm where do you send your resources grassroots and uh, you know black girl hockey club is magical for that they work with so many grassroots organizations you don't have to look hard look in your own community people 
there's change makers in your community close to you. You know, that, that, that auntie that you've written off, no, that auntie is doing good work. So keep that in mind. It doesn't look like one thing. So that's like a short answer. And if, <laughs> allyship is a funny thing. Um, I think I heard this and it was, I believe it was Andre Carlisle who was quoting Zara King. I believe I'm not sure he's a soccer writer. He was saying that we don't need allies, we need collaborators. And that, that for me was like, okay, that's it. For somebody that didn't want me to ask that question, I'm glad I did. Thank you, Shireen. Um, speaking of black girl hockey and, and Renee, uh, I don't need to tell you about the hockey world. Um, and I was gonna jump right to you next about performative stuff um, because everybody was watching those early days um, this summer and there was Matt Dumba all by himself, right? Um, and that I thought spoke volumes. And so as I was preparing to go to you, we got a great question from Chris uh, Hugh, who says, uh, Renee, what are your thoughts on the NHL's hockey is for everyone slogan? Sounds nice, doesn't it? Um, is the NHL doing enough to promote inclusivity? Because hockey still feels like the old boys club. Renee, the floor is yours. You know, what I tell folks who, you know, work for various hockey organizations is that you can affect change within your office. You can affect change within your peer group, within your friend group, you know, within the group chat. Uh, if you have a little bit of power at your job, you, and even if you don't, you can affect change. And so it doesn't matter if you are a top executive in the C-suite or if you are, you know, working in ticketing, you have the power to do something to combat anti-blackness and and or to con yeah to combat anti-blackness and to work in anti-racism. You just have to kind of put yourself out there, like Shireen was saying. You have to be brave and you have to be no no nonsense and you have to be a strong conspirator. Um, listening and learning is wonderful for allies, but I we need to see the work. We we need to see the moves being made. And so, you know, I, I, I like to talk to people and just kind of get them out of that, um, that trepidation of making the moves and wondering what, you know, their bosses or their peers are going to say when they uh, suggest some sort of anti-racist uh, action in their offices or in, in their organizations. Uh, and most of the time, the light bulb moment is, you know, just me encouraging folks to be brave and, and them realizing that they have the ability to do little things, just little things like um, address hiring uh, disparities in their, in their uh, offices, uh, to, to hire you know, volunteers and interns that come from BIPOC communities. Uh, you know, it, it's those little things that add up. So looking at the NHL's Hockey is for Everyone program, I don't, I don't look at that program as something that I'm trying to shift or, or make a reality because hockey already is for everyone. It's just a matter of uh, the white male population uh, accepting that fact because it's already true. Um, hockey's for me and hockey's for you and hockey's for Shireen. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't belong to, to a specific group. It belongs to all of us. It's just a matter of folks accepting that and moving, moving past their, um, the stereotypes that come with hockey, that, are, that uh, hockey is uh, steeped in um, these, these stereotypes and um, the old boys club, as Chris mentioned in the chat. And so I would say that it's not up to me to decide whether um, the Hockey is for Everyone program is working or if it's honest or if it's authentic. What I would say is keep your, you know, keep doing the work. Um, like Shireen and uh, everyone has said that this is not a one-off. This is uh, not a sprint. Um, this is a, a long-term lifelong decision. And so if you want to, uh, affect authentic change in hockey. You got You can't just do it once a year. 
during February. You can't just do it once a, a year on a special high day. It's got to be every single day in every aspect of your job. It's got to start, here I am, I'm a hop on my soapbox, because it's got to start in youth hockey. It's got to start with the board of directors. It's got to start with the C-suites. It's got to start with the coaches and the way that they talk to their kids and the way that they address the parents and the way that they listen to the concerns that are brought up. I saw um, Ashley in the chat is part of the Black Girl Hockey Club fam asking about, you know, how do you get um, more BIPOC women involved in hockey because there's just not. And what I would say is, you know, we've got to start small. We've got to start where we can um, in the grassroots programs and encouraging grassroots programs uh, like, you know, uh, RGV Hockey, who is a real Grand Valley ho roller hockey uh, association in Texas. They don't have a uh, ice rink anywhere near them, so they started a roller hockey league. And they're promoting hockey in a community that didn't have access to hockey, you know, a couple years ago. Uh, HPOC movement, Hockey Players of Color movement, who are a Black women-led mentorship program for young uh, burgeoning hockey players of all genders and races. And can you imagine a young white boy hockey player having a Black woman mentor in hockey? That's going to change the game, right? That's going to change the, the way that he looks at the world. And those are the types of uh, institutions and organizations that we should be supporting in order to truly make hockey for everyone. Outstanding, Renee. And we're going to get to Patria. Madison has a great question, but just to that point about who's at the table. Um, my colleague Jamie Strashen and I did a did a deep dive um, investigation into BIPOC representation in the NHL, NFL, NBA. In the NHL, we looked at general managers, coaches, presidents of teams the people who are making the decisions, 95% of every one of those positions held in the NHL are held by white men. You don't know what you don't know and you don't, you're don't. you unaware of your blind spots, aren't you, if, if you don't have that at the table. So thank you for that. Patria, to that point, uh, Madison asked a question about studying sports management. She's also doing that. And she's wondering um, how your education in the field has helped you take positive progressive action in sport? I think that's a great question. Yes, that is a wonderful question. Thanks, Madison. Um, I feel like at the beginning of my journey, I didn't feel like I belonged in the field because um, when I entered uh, literally in sport management abroad, there was over 300 people that registered for the program and we're all in. So we were like the highest department or program that had that like the highest registration. and. Um, I was literally the only Muslim woman. Um, I, and at that time, I didn't feel like I belonged in there. And um, so then Ponce stream hit, but I feel like now that in 2019, when I graduated from my undergrad, I felt like it kind of gave me the, bo the boost and the confidence because I went through the whole process of like what it actually takes to run an organization, a sport organization specifically. Um, it gave me the confidence that I needed to, you know, start up the league because like I said, it wasn't an overnight thing that I wanted to start up a league. It was something that I wrote down when I actually entered into this sport management program. So um, in terms of like the process is, it's, I feel like it definitely gave me the confidence, but um, I still had to, you know, go outside of the um, the sport management program, like literally volunteer and network with other people that are in the field. Although the relationship wasn't strong at that time, but I feel like me being in the field and just learning and observing and applying what I've learned in the course um, and applying it to, you know, in actual events of when I was volunteering has kind of helped me see things from a different perspective. And I could actually apply it into, you know, the volunteering that I'm doing currently and the league as well. Um, yeah, so it's a matter of networking and um, just get your face literally rec get recognized. Now the people that I volunteer with are reaching out to want me be part of their organization, whatever they're doing to, you know, basically the hype, you know? So uh, yeah, just literally work hard and network. Um, that's my tip. Nice, nice. For all of you, let's go around, around the table here. Um, we don't see enough women sport on TV. That's that's not shocking to you. Where are we at? Where is this going, Shireen? 
So I just, you know, there's statistics, the Women's Media Center in New York City offers statistics and so do a lot of media trackers about um, the amount, like less than, you know, 5% is dedicated to women's sports and let's not make a mistake about that. The product is there. The product is 100% there. We saw with the Challenge Cup, the NWSL, I mean, they, like, the numbers exploded. They were managed to bubble really well and effectively in Utah. It's there. I think when we look at, for example, the history of media and the most watched games in the United States are women's games, national team games at, at World Cup events. So these are things that we can't conflate that, oh, well, women are, don't make as much money as men, but like economics 101, and I didn't do great with numbers, but I can tell you all this, that if you want to make money, you invest money. This is not difficult. And there is no greater, no greater. I'm not just saying this because I stand Kayla. There's no greater way to do this in the WNBA. They have given the blueprint from everything from social justice to how to engage with fans and how to immerse themselves in community within themselves and beyond. It is one of the most incredible leagues in the world, in my opinion, have shown solidarity with NWSL, with hockey, like you see cross, cross sport help. Now, this is something that I think people don't, it's what they value. And we know that labor of women, particularly with racialized women, hasn't been valued. Women's labor isn't valued. One of the worst things to ever happen in the history of Canada, in addition to genocide of indigenous folks and slavery, obviously, but in the sports realm is not sustaining a women's league domestically of basketball, of hockey, or of soccer. This is a shame. And this is something that Canada needs to fix. ASAP because we don't currently we boast some of the best athletes in the world in these sports but we don't have a domestic league I'm sorry so there's a lot that needs to happen at various levels and in terms of getting those women on TV we've seen we've seen partnerships I mean Sportsnet is showing the you know TSN was showing the curling Sportsnet is showing the PWHPA gap dream gap tour this is important it needs to start somewhere and i just want to remind all y'all that the nba didn't start making money right away it took some time so don't come at me with they make this money and if you even want to know like for example women's sports how many billions of dollars are poured into men's sports and men's football like proper football particularly like it's not going to happen overnight but there needs to be a commitment to it because the the product is there like, I don't need to tell you, like the NCAA Final Four, the women's tournament is the most exciting thing ever. And like, you can at me if you want, because I'm ready with my, my, my gifts. So I, I'm not at you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, outstanding, Shireen. Uh, Kayla, let's, let's go to you because um, you're out there, you're doing your thing and not enough people are seeing you do it. What are the conversations that happen between all of you? Honestly, Shireen, like she took the mic, she said it, I was over here snapping because everything she said was factual. Like at the end of the day, like when you're, if you can see something on TV, you can support it, you can dream it, you can become it. And we just need to provide those same opportunities for women. I will have to shout out um, Sportsnet. I think they just came into a, a partnership recently with Canada Basketball with the effort of saying that they're gonna promote and put more of our games on TV. So like. Uh, people can watch us nationwide, which I think is incredible and a great first step. Um, we need to see more of that though, because I remember growing up as a kid, young girl, when I started getting into basketball, I couldn't find women's basketball to watch. So for the longest time, I was just watching the NBA. And then eventually my dad was like, okay, it, it was so hard. Like you basically have to like try and search and like, okay, let's pay for this specific channel or this station so that we can actually watch and actually see women's sports. Um, so then I was able to start seeing the women's college basketball. And then eventually when I saw the WNBA like playing, I was like, this exists, this is real, like those women look like me, like this is, it becomes a reality in my, like a young kid's head when you see someone who looks like you doing something that at like, the highest level, you're like, oh my goodness, this could be me one day. So everything Shereen said is facts, like just, you have to invest in it, you have to put money towards women's sports, you have to put it out there so people can see it, so they can support it, and it falls back to the title of our panel. If they can see it, they can become it, they can believe it, and they can dream it, so. Yeah, I, I don't have much else to add to what Shereen said. Nice, nice. Thanks, Kayla. Um, uh, Renee, we're going to come to you, same question, but but Tara Chisholm adds an important point about parasports as well. Um, and and all of all of the representation we're talking about today. So so how important is it? I mean, Shereen and Kayla have, have articulated that, but to you, Renee, parasports, women in sport, BIPOC representation in sport, LGBTQ plus issues in sport, Wade Davis, a feminist at the University of Chicago, him and I have a lot of talks. He says, we're not waiting for 
one person to come out in pro sports. We actually have an idea of the prototypical superhero type of person to come out. So I'll let you take the floor and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think the audience is there already for women's sports. And it, it needs to be as, you know, there's nothing that I could add that Shireen hasn't said or that Kayla didn't already mention in terms of representation and uh, financial support. But, you know, when we were uh, watching the uh, women's hockey when they were in the bubble, uh, I was on Twitch and, you know, just kind of uh, my first time I got a Twitch account so that I could watch these games. And the audience was there, you know, the fans were in the chat, they were hyping each other up. Uh, they were buying merchandise. I saw yesterday or the day before yesterday that uh, Soroya Tinker from the Riveters had the number one sold jersey uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, because of you know her activism in the bubble and just her amazing play. And I think that the audience is there. You know, we just, just like the other women said, we've got to get the, the exposure. We've got to get the financial support. We've got to get the the you know, the men's leagues to to uh, you know give some airtime, move aside for a minute, and let the women show what we can do. Uh, I love to see things like you know the women hockey players participating in the men's all-star games. I think those are, that's a wonderful way to give exposure, but the audience is already there. We, we're not trying to pilfer the, the men's audience. You know, we have our own audience and they're, they're there ready and waiting to spend their money, to, you know, turn on the television, to travel to games. They, we just need the opportunity. And if, you know, we can get some investors, we can get some folks who are passionate about these sports and who are in it for the long term. Um, I think that there's a real chance that we can excel in, you know, having these uh, women's leagues actually get the exposure that they deserve because it's been, it's been, you know, a while now that the WNBA has been doing the work and they deserve to have the recognition. You know, you were mentioning, Devin, that they did not get the recognition that they deserved all summer long with all the amazing social justice um, spotlights that they were they were doing the entire time that you guys were in the bubble, Kayla. It was amazing. And it, you guys were at the forefront and everybody knew it, but nobody was talking about it. It, it was just, it was ridiculous to me to, that I, I remember being on a panel and someone saying, oh yes, all the work that the NBA has done. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's the WNBA that started this. Um, black women at the forefront, it's not a surprise. And it's also not a surprise that it's, it can, it's completely ignored because as Shireen was saying, you know, the labor of women is not um, appreciated and especially if, and so the audience is there. We need the financial support. We need the um, the long term support in order to thrive. Because um, the the young kids that are coming up, the young boys and the girls, being able to uh, see something like that um, just gives them the opportunity to pursue the dreams that they have uh, as far as they want to take it. And you know, Black Girl Hockey Club, we have scholarship program that we do. And that's the, the main reason why we do the scholarship program in order to continue facilitating these dreams that these young girls have as long as they want to play hockey. Um, you know, we, we want them to, they don't have to go professional. They don't have to go to college hockey. If they just want to play beer league, that's fine. But we want to help make those dreams happen because if they can see each other on the ice, then they're, you know, they can encourage one another. And if they can build the community together off the ice, then we have something sustainable. Nice, nice. Thanks, Renee. Um, thoughtful answer for sure. We're gonna open up the mic. Look out guys, technology, here we go. Open mic night. Um, I understand it's Ritu Singh who has a question and is brought in now. The floor is yours. Hi, hi everyone. Can you hear me? We got you. Awesome, awesome. First of all, thank you so much. This has been like an amazing session. And it's so nice to hear from people who are like this inspiring. 
Um, so my question is that um, as a player growing up, we've heard a lot of conversations, be it your friends, your family, I guess even the men's team sometimes as a basketball player, that they don't, sometimes they don't really play the sport, but then they still have an opinion as to how women play, as to how uh, you compare yourself with the, um, what do you say, like, you know, can you dunk that much? I mean, it's all in physiology, right? It's not about, it's not about uh, skill. It's just about how the body is made up. So there are a lot of different things which go on. So, um, well, my question is, if people still have opinions about something like this, what are some conversations that can happen when you can, you know, change such mindsets or um, I guess just speak to them about why things are like that? Ritu, I wish you could see, I don't know if you can see the faces of all the panelists, but they all had very visceral reactions when you asked that question. It's a great question. Uh, Fatria, why don't we start with you? And, and guys, we've got about eight minutes left, so let's keep them short. But I, I would love all of your thoughts on this because everyone has those opinions. I know that. So Fatria, to you. Right. Um, it's crazy because um, I was actually going to answer that for my previous question, um, that one of the things uh, as audience is we shouldn't be, uh, don't compare our game to the men's game because we bring a different perspective to the sport. Uh, we actually uh, focus on the actual sport where the men's focus on the entertainment aspect. So if you want to support women's sport, um, go in it from a uh, perspective of actually supporting women's skills, not comparing us to the men's sport. I'm going to keep it simple and say that. So thank you for that question. Wonderful. Thank you. Nice, Kayla, to you. Um, yes, I agree with Katria. And then also, um, although yes, we are different men and women, last time I checked, there are women who are just as athletic, who can do great things. I know dunking isn't a huge part of women's basketball, but let me tell you, there are plenty of women out there who can dunk the ball and dunk it with uh, force. And just the way we play the game. I, I will say this, just to keep it short. I find that those who always have an opinion on this aren't always those who play basketball or those who play it at a high level. Because at the end of the day, game recognizes game. When I talk with other fellow basketball players who play at a high level, men, they you don't hear this from them. They respect our game, they respect what we're doing, they respect our grind and our abilities. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. Keyboard warriors, they're out there. Shireen, how do you deal with the keyboard warriors? I mean, everyone has an opinion, but I mean, I was laughing because men have an opinion on everything. There's a reason why mansplaining is a term. Like I would love somebody to come up to Kayla and be like, yeah, do you really play? Like candles are a thing. LeBron James is sporting the orange hoodie, which was like, quite frankly, the most popular accessory this year, undoubtedly. And Kayla said it, game recognizes game. You don't got game. You have a lot of opinions that are based on nothing. So, you know, I have nothing to add. And to you, Renee, because in hockey, there's a lot of armchair, couch sitting, keyboard hockey players out there. You know, I just think of all the comments and um, narrative around um, Serena Williams. And when guys come on and they say, if I got on the court with Serena, uh, that they would do something. And, and then I remember a little viral video of this dude who actually did get on the court with Serena and she smoked him and game recognizes game I don't really think there's anything else to say you know there's no comparison um folks who don't play sports uh, cannot are not gonna go up against even women who do play sports so they, they can just you know do like that poor gentleman who got um, his racket handed to him on the court with Serena and just go ahead and have a drink of water and sit down um, because you're not you're not doing anything special. Awesome. Um, we have five minutes left. Um, so we're going to wind it down here. We have a question from Jordan. It's addressed to Shireen. They're loving your burn it all down fire today, Shireen, which is nice. And we're all appreciative of it, appreciative of all of you. But let's go, let's go around to wrap it up here. It's a good question from Jordan to Shireen about how exhausting this is to do this work day in and day out. And, and um, what is it going to take to get more and more people to get the message, what needs to change? 
I think that's a nice way to, to end this. So we've got about five minutes, guys. Shireen, I'll get you to start and then we'll work our way around uh, because you're doing the heavy lifting. Uh, the, the movement, the community is growing, but it's exhausting, no doubt. Shireen. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Jordan, for that. And I, I just want to say that I work in collaboration. I've had wonderful teachers. Uh, one of my greatest teachers ever is Dr. Amir Rose Davis, one of my co-hosts on Burn It All Down, and the people that I work with, and I will nod to that. Um, just to say that pacing myself, I came in not much like fifth year, not thinking there was a space for me. And there always a space for you. And I'm, people say, I don't have a space at the table. I'm like, build your own effing chair. And I'm at a place where I wanted to, I, I feel like I just wanted to open a window or a door in my career, but actually, essentially, I want to tear down walls and reconstruct. And that's fine. That's long-term vision. But in terms of managing yourself, taking a break sometimes, getting offline, keeping motivated is really important. And I just want to leave you all with one quote from the queen herself, Audrey Lord. And she said that caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. And you can take those words to mean that you will stay engaged and keep going because sports has always been political and it'll always be about that. So reject the nonsense, take care of yourself and keep going. Beautiful, Shireen, thank you. Uh, three minutes left, Renee, to you. Yeah, I'm a big advocate for self-care, and I, I do think that um, one thing that has really helped me keep going is um, having folks like Shireen to uh, lean on when times are getting hard and to who reach out to me uh, when, when I need it. Uh, Shireen is notorious for just texting me compliments and making me incredibly uncomfortable because I can't take a compliment to save my soul, but she knows that. So she just lobs them on top of me all the time. But, you know, having people like that in my corner um, makes, it, makes me know that I can take a rest and Shireen will pick up the slack while I'm gone and vice versa. When she's, you know, putting the face mask and the cucumbers on her eyes, I can do the work while, and pick up the slack for her as well. And I think that that's, What's um, so wonderful about uh, the community that we've built, um, it, and I wasn't surprised to find out that Shireen knew everybody on this panel already, um, because it is a community. And although you know I uh, didn't previously know Fitria or Kayla, now I do, and now I'll I'm going to be following their work, and I, I think that's really what it's all about. And so you know I would say that amplifying one another's voices and um, keeping, keeping an open mind and an open heart uh, towards your fellow conspirators and your fellow anti-racist workers is going to be key as you continue to move forward, you know, building the community and um, sustaining that community. Thank you, Renee. We're getting down to the last seconds here. So Patria, we'll go over to you. And then Kayla's got a basketball game to play. I don't know what you're all doing today, but uh, Patria, to you. Yes, um, I would say we've, we've brought up the community aspect so many times already, knowing that like who, the work that you're doing for, like um, your purpose, you know, I feel like that's a drive between all, for all of us uh, with the work that we're doing. So uh, yes, the society is tough and the work we're doing is, is literally tough. So it's just a matter of we know our purpose and we know the work that we're doing is going to have a, a big impact on the next generation, even if we're not here. That's a drive for me. So, yeah. Nice. Nice. And Kayla, to you, I think three hours away from tip off. You you end the show right now. It's all yours. Um, the big word of the day here to end it, community, because that's what the first thing that I thought of, too. Um, one, building up the next generation and pouring into them. Um, and then two, knowing that you go further together. You don't have to do it alone. Get in the community of people who are like-minded, who are doing the same things that you want to be doing. Um, when you work with other people and you do it together, you can get further and you can have more of an impact. So. Nice. Kick ass in the game today. Kick ass in Tokyo. We'll all be watching and cheering. Uh, listen, uh, to the four of you, uh, it's just honored to share space with you all today. So thank you. Um, learned a lot. Um, and, and to all of the attendees, thank you 
for tuning in. You've got uh, three more sessions today. Make sure you're following us at CBC Sports on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all the things. We'd love to hear what you learned today. Next up, how women are challenging the sports media industry. Check your email for the link and, and uh, Monica will also get you the, to the link. But again, to Shireen, Renee, Kayla and Fatria, so grateful for you. The work continues. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Devin. Thank you, everyone.